So today's episode comes to you courtesy of Corey, who's been supporting this channel as a general tier patron. I truly couldn't do this without the support from amazing patrons like Corey. So again, Corey, thank you so much. And for the personalized deck tack, Corey chose Grist the Hunger Tide with a focus on Insect Tribal. Grist is a Planeswalker that has three starting loyalty and costs one black green. It has as long as Grist the Hunger Tide isn't on the battlefield, it's a 1-1 Insect addition to its other types. It's plus one is create a one one black and green insect creature token, then mill a card if an insect card was milled this way, put a loyalty counter on Grist and repeat this process. It's minus two is you may sacrifice a creature when you destroy a target creature or planeswalker. And it's minus five is each opponent loses life equal to the number of creature cards in your graveyard. So with an insect tribal deck built around this commander, we're gonna get an absurd amount of value out of that plus one. If we keep hitting insect after insect, we just keep doing it over and over again, getting a ton of loyalty counters on Grist and filling the board with insect creature tokens. And of course, while we're filling the board, we're also filling our graveyard, and then that minus five can be incredibly deadly to take our opponents out and drain their life. And of course, there are plenty of ways that we can set ourselves up for some massive turns with this commander, and yeah, there's some really exciting things that we can do with it. Now, before we jump into the cards in this deck, though, I do just want to mention that every single card in this deck outside of the commander is less than $1, so it's a very budget-friendly deck. And as I'm going through the cards on this episode, I'm going to be taking you through different tactics to show you how this deck works and how we're going to win with it. And finally, if you are interested in this deck, make sure you check out the deck list link in the description below. And now with all that said, let's jump into it. First up, there's Wayfarer's Bobble, which we can pay two to tap and sacrifice to get a basic land into play tapped. And then some other great turn one plays are Search for Tomorrow and Wild Growth. Search for Tomorrow, we can suspend two for a green to get a basic into play untapped, and Wild Growth is going to enchant a land, and whenever that land is tapped, we get an extra green. Moving on, next up, we've got Feral Ground, which basically does the exact same thing, but it's going to be one man of any color instead of a green. And then we've got Rampant Growth, which is going to get us a basic into play tapped, and Edge Bottom, which does the exact same thing, as long as we've got four or fewer lands, or we can cycle it away by sacrificing a land. Next up, we've actually got a creature that can help us ramp to a secure tribe elder. We can sacrifice to get that base skin to play tapped. Speaking of basics, Cultivate's gonna get us one base skin or a hand and one into play tapped, and then Splendor Reclamation get us a ton of lands into play. It says return all land cards from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. Again, by milling lands into our graveyard with something, you know, like our commander, we can get a lot of lands in there and we can get a lot back into play with this. And speaking of graveyards, we've got Halo Scarab, which is an insect that has pay two eggs out from your graveyard, create a treasure token. And yet another insect that can help us ramp is Nantuko Elder, which can tap for one in a green. But now that we've talked about ramping and getting ourselves set up, let's talk about even more insects. Let's start off by talking about some insects that can grow throughout the game with Mortician Beetle, Scoop Mob, and Phantom Mantuko. Mortician Beetle says whenever a player sacrifices a creature, you may put a plus one counter on Mortician Beetle. Whereas Scoop Mob says at the beginning of your upkeep, if you control five or more lands, put four counters on Scoop Mob. Phantom Nantuko is going to enter the battlefield with two counters on it, and if damage would be dealt to it, we prevent that damage, remove a counter from it, and we can tap it to put a counter on it. Next up, we've got Bloodline Pretender, which is a changeling, so yes, it is an insect in addition to, you know, all of their creature types, and it says when it enters battlefield, choose a creature type. Whenever the creature of the type enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one counter on Bloodline Pretender. So again, with all of our insects coming into play, including all of our token insects, this can get huge. Speaking of which, there's Swarm of Bloodflies, which enters the battlefield with two counters on it, and whenever another creature dies, we get a counter on it. And then Vorpede is a 5-4 Vigilance and Trample and Undying, so when it dies, it comes back with a counter on it. Moving on, we've got Skylasher, which has Flash, it can't be countered, and it's got Reach and Protection from Blue. Whereas Crown Forgers doesn't have any keywords on it, but it can gain us a ton of life because when it comes into play, we gain one life for each creature in our graveyard. Which, again, with this, that can be a ton. Next up, we've got some insects that can make us even more insects with Saber Ants, Brute Hatch, Nantuko, and Hornet Nest. Whenever Saber Ants or Brute Hatch, Nantuko are dealt damage, we get that many 1-1 one, one green insect creature tokens. And then Hornet Nest may have Defender, but it says whenever it's dealt damage, create that many 1-1 one, one green insect creature tokens with Flying and Death Touch. Speaking of Death Touch Flyers, we've got Hornet Queen, which when it enters the battlefield, we get four of them. 
And then finally, there's Giant Anaphage, which is a 7-7 with Trample. And whenever it hits a player, we get a token that's a copy of Giant Anaphage. So yeah, this stays in play for a while and gets some damage through. We can get a ton of copies of it. But of course, we're nowhere near done with insects and making insects just yet. Next up, we've also got cards like Crawling Sensation and Crawling Infestation, which can help us out in multiple ways. Crawling Sensation says, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may mill two, and whenever one or more land cards are put in your graveyard from anywhere for the first time each turn, put a 1-1 green insect creature token onto the battlefield. And then Crawling Infestation is very similar, but it's only during our turn, and it happens whenever creature cards are put into our graveyard. Regardless, each of these can help us mill to get even more creatures into our graveyard, and of course can help fill the board with even more insects. And speaking of milling and insects, next up we've got Carrying Grub and Moldgraph Millipede. Carrying Grub is going to get plus X plus zero X the greatest power among creatures in our graveyard, and when it comes into play, we mill four cards. Whereas Moldgraph Millipede is going to mill three cards when it comes into play, and we get a counter on it for each creature card in our graveyard, which again can be a ton. Next up, we can also get creatures into our graveyard by actually sacrificing them with cards like Dross Hopper, Devouring Swarm, and Antuko Husk. By sacrificing a creature, draws Hopper gains flying until end of turn, Devouring Swarm is going to get plus and plus one until end of turn, and Antuko Husk is going to get plus two plus two until end of turn. And now you might think we're done with insects, but of course we're not quite done with them just yet. So next up, let's talk about some insects that can help us with removal with cards like Cost of Caterpillar, Mask Vandal, and Antuka Vigilante. We can pay one in a green to sacrifice Cost of Caterpillar to destroy target artifact or enchantment. Whereas Mask Vandal is a changeling, so again, yes, an insect, and it says when it enters the battlefield, you may exile a creature card from your graveyard if you do exile target artifact or enchantment and opponent controls. And then Antuka Vigilante has morph in when it's turned face up, destroy target artifact or enchantment. Next up, there's No Mage Advocate, which says, Tap, return two target cards from an opponent's graveyard to their hand, destroy target artifact, or enchantment. And then both Fire Speedle and Brain Weevil can actually mess with our opponent's hands. When Fire Speedle enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card, and Brain Weevil has Sacrifice it, target player discards two cards. And again, sacrificing this isn't necessarily a bad thing, because the more creatures are in our graveyard, the more valuable our graveyard is for our commander's minus five. And speaking of sacrificing creatures, we've got Distended Mindbender, which has Emerge, and when it enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals their hand, you may choose a nominee card from with converted mana cost 3 or less, and a card with converted mana cost 4 or greater, that player discards those cards. But of course, we're not quite done with messing with our opponent's hands just yet, because we also have Brain Maggot, which has, when it enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals their hand, and we can choose a nominee card from it, exile that card until Brain Maggot leaves the battlefield. Whereas Blight Beetle is going to affect our opponents in a different way, it has protection from green and says creature opponents control can't have plus one counters put on them. So this effect might seem small, but it can be absolutely devastating against certain decks. Next up though, we've got Xanthan Swarm, which says when it attacks, defending player can't cast spells this turn. So if we want to stop a player from stopping us on our turn, well, we can just swing at them with this. Moving on though, there's Plague Fiend, which says whenever deals combination to a creature, destroy that creature, lets the controller pays too. And speaking of destroying creatures, there's Kral Harpooner, which is a 3 2 with reach, and when it enters the battlefield, we choose up to one target creature with flying we don't control. Kral Harpooner is going to get plus X plus zero until end of turn, X the number of creature cards in your graveyard, then you can have Kral Harpooner fight that creature. And again, of course, we can have a massive number of creatures in our graveyard. And speaking of taking creatures out, though, there's Bane of the Living, which has Morph, and when it's turned face up, all creatures get minus X minus X until end of turn. So yeah, this can be a fantastic way to wipe out the board. Finally, though, there's Nameless Inversion, which is a tribal instant shapeshifter spell. So yes, this card is all creature types at all times, including an insect. And it says target creature gets plus three minus three and loses all creature types until end of turn. So this can be a great way to remove one of our opponent's creatures or in certain situations, pump one of our own. But just as our insects can help us with removal, they also can help us with card advantage. <laughs> So now let's move on and talk about even more insects with Sturge, Circuit Mender, and Antuco Cultivator. Sturge has Blood Drain, pay one to black, pay one life, sacrifice Sturge, draw a card. Whereas Circuit Mender has when it enters the battlefield, we gain two life, and when it leaves the battlefield, we draw a card. Next up, there's Antuco Cultivator, which says when it enters the battlefield, you may discard any number of land cards, put that many plus one counters on Antuco Cultivator, and draw that many cards. So if our hand is flooded with lands, well, we can replace those with other cards and make this massive. Next up, there's Springleaf Awakener, which is a 6-5 with Ninjutsu, and it has when it deals common to destroy player, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. Speaking of which, there's Moldgraph Monstrosity, which is massive, and 8-8 with Trample, and when it dies, we exile and return two creature cards at random from our graveyard to the battlefield. 
Next up, there's a Zoni, which has an incredible ATB. When it enters the battlefield, we create a 1 1 black and green insect creature token for each creature card in our graveyard. Which, again, while milling with our commander, can be a ton. And on top of that, we can pay black, green, and sacrifice another creature to gain one life and draw a card. So this can be a fantastic draw engine for us as well. Speaking of draw engines, though, we've got some that can really help us out with Death Reap Ritual, Moldervine Reclamation, and Fecundity. Death Reap Ritual says at the beginning of each end step, if a creature died this turn, you may draw a card. Moldervine Reclamation says whenever a creature you control dies, you gain one life and draw a card. And then Fecundity says whenever a creature dies, that creature's controller may draw a card. So yeah, each of these can draw us a lot of cards and provide a ton of value throughout the game. Speaking of value, there's Sylvan Anthem, which says green creatures you control get plus plus one, and whenever a green creature enters the battlefield under your control, scry one. So this can pump our entire army of token insects, which again are black and green, and on top of that, whenever those green creatures, including our token insects, come into play, we scry, and that can give us a lot of card selection throughout the game. And then there's Return of the Wild Speaker, which can help us out in one of two ways. It says, choose one, draw a card to equal to the greatest power among non-human creatures you control, and non-human creatures you control go plus three plus three until end of turn. So this can either draw us a decent amount of cards, depending on what creatures we have in play, or pump our entire team for a surprise KO. And speaking of a knockout, well, we've also got cards like Warlock Class and Peer into the Abyss, which ironically actually combo together. Warlock Class says, at the beginning of your end step, if a creature died this turn, each opponent loses one life. Once it gets to level 2, it's going to have us look at the top 3 cards of our library. We get one of them into our hand, the rest into our graveyard. And then at level 3, it says that at the beginning of your end step, each opponent loses life equal to the life they lost this turn. So of course, that can essentially double up our commanders minus 5 and make our opponents lose a ton of life. Speaking of which, there's Peer into the Abyss, which says target player draws cards equal to half the number of cards in their library and loses half their life round up each time. So first up, one option with this card is to actually target ourselves. Yes, we lose a lot of life, but we draw half our library, which is an absurd amount of cards. And of course, with that, then we go to our end step and have to discard, and we can discard a ton of creature cards to make it so that our commander's minus five can be incredibly deadly. Another option is that we target an opponent with this, make them draw a ton of cards, but also lose half their life and set them up to be taken out with our commander. And again, like I mentioned before, Warlock Class and Peer to the Abyss actually combo together and basically just a one-shot KO on an opponent. But speaking of spicy plays... In this deck, we've got one card that, in my opinion, stands above the rest, and that is the Golden Pig of this deck, which is the number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pig for this deck is Forever Young. It's a sorcery for one in a black that says, put any number of creature cards from your graveyard on top of your library, draw a card. So this can set us up for an incredible play with our commander. Throughout the game, of course, we can get a lot of creatures into our graveyard, of course, with our commander's help as well, and then we cast something like this to get those creatures back on top of our library so that we can activate our commanders plus one for an incredible effect. Because by getting all those insects on top of our library, we can just keep milling all those insects back into our graveyard, and every single time we do so, we get another loyalty counter on our commander, and of course, we make an insect army as well. So essentially, this is a way for just two mana to draw a card and also get an absurd amount of loyalty counters on our commander and make an absurd amount of insects as well. So yeah, because of all those reasons, that's why this is the golden pig of this deck. And of course, we've got some other cards that are very close to this one. The only main difference is that these are, yes, instants, but they do cost one more mana with Grave Purge, Foot Bottom Feast, and Bone Harvest. But yeah, these essentially do the exact same thing. Though, okay, as you mentioned, Bone Harvest is a delayed draw. We draw the beginning of the next turn's upkeep, but still, all these basically the exact same, and yeah, I can set ourselves up for some massive plays. But now that we've talked about every single non land card in this deck, let's talk about the lands. First up, we've got Command Tower, which can tap for either of our colors, and Exotic Orchard, which can do so most of the time. Moving on, we've got Evolving Wild, Terramorphic Expanse, and Riveteer's Overlook, which can each be sacrificed to get us a base gonna play tenth, and Riveteer's Overlook is actually gonna gain us one life when we do so. And then Ash Barons has basic land cycling for one, and Mirror Landscape and Blight Woodland can each actually ramp us by getting two lands into play tapped. Moving on, Temple of Malady is going to enter the battlefield tapped. It's going to have a scry one. It can tap for either of our colors. And Golgari brought from also enters the battlefield tapped. It's going to bounce a land we control back to our hand, and it can tap for both of our colors. And finally, the rest of this deck is made up of forests and swamps. But now that we've talked about every single card in this deck, let's talk about the price. <music> 
Like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, every single card in this deck outside of the commander is incredibly budget friendly at less than $1. So this deck itself is, yes, budget friendly as well with an estimated cost of $29.17. And actually, that cost includes basic lands at $0.10 cents a piece, so you might be able to save even more if you already got those basics. Speaking of potential savings, you might be able to save even more than that by buying this deck on TCG Player and utilizing heavily played and damaged cards, which of course need a home too. That being said, keep in mind that this estimated cost does not include the cost of shipping, which might vary depending upon where you live. And with that, the show is coming to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. We also have a ton of brand new t-shirt designs in stock, so make sure you check out those as well. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support.